if you look at the data and you look at potentially the reasons why uh, physicians have moved away from, I would say, aggressive intervention. First, there are data that spontaneous closure occurs. And if you look at bigger babies over 1200 grams, what you can see is the vast majority of those infants by three weeks of life will have spontaneous closure. However, if you look at babies under 750 grams who really reflect the highest risk patients of all neonatal morbidity, the fundamental question to be asked is, is exposure of over half of these babies to an average of more than 50 days an acceptable risk? The second question one needs to ask is, how does spontaneous closure occur? And we actually have no idea how does spontaneous closure occur in these babies. Is it, we assume, a process of natural remodeling? And again, bear in mind that the immature ductus is very different in its architecture to the term ductus. It's got less muscle, it doesn't have vasorum, and so forth, which raises the question, is closure through another mechanism? through augmentation in pulmonary vascular resistance, through remodeling of the pulmonary vessels, are we leading to a reduction in net um, uh, flow across the ductus through the differential pressure gradient across the PDA? If this was the case, that would be concerning. The second reason, and probably the most compelling reason that has moved the field away from kind of aggressive intervention is Bill Bennett's meta-analysis. Uh, which basically shows whether it's medical or surgical therapy uh, treatment closes the PDA, but based on these trials, there was no difference in any of the neonatal morbidities, including lung disease. So how do we think about this contemporary literature? Well, I recently gave a talk at the AAP meeting and uh, one of the trainees presented a case of a one month old infant who is dependent on a ventilator with a moderate sized PDA and left to right shunt. And I was asked the question, would I surgically close this ductus? And my answer was, I don't know. I don't have enough information. All you're telling me is that the ductus is patent. They proceeded to say that then the baby developed some subjective increase in left heart volume loading using the LA to AO ratio. Again, I'm uncertain. And part of the reason for the uncertainty is we know from imaging data that subjective assessment of size, size of vessel, size of chamber is highly unreliable with kappa coefficients as low as 0.2 for many of these measurements. Which gets us to the fundamental question. When we look at the trials, and I think it's incredibly important that we, when we think about evidence, we think about evidence in terms of, is it relevant to practice today? And Based on the way in which we evaluate the problem, was there diagnostic homogeneity and did we truly appraise the problem in the trials? The second question we need to ask is who were the controlled patients? And ultimately, and I think this is the holy grail, and if anything, I think the data from the past had certainly taught us that extremes in practice are probably not good. So if we look at imaging data, so this is Kurt Deval's meta-analysis of all the trials. Up to 40% of the randomized trials did not have echo. Secondly, and this is an image here, and this is Dr. Ed Bell, who is one of my colleagues and uh, uh, former um, kind of leader in the field. And uh, this is Ed in the 1970s using echocardiography. But why I put this picture up is that the tools available in the 70s and the 80s were not very good compared to what we have available today. So image quality is fundamental to all imaging-based research analysis. <clears throat> and the reason for that is, again, you know, across the world, uh, the standard by which people adjudicate whether or not to intervene uh, for the ductus is basically the size of the vessel. And you know, in the image on the right hand side here, you can see this nice red jet, which reflects a left to right shunt. Um, however, if your image quality is poor or the operator um, has got, is inexperienced, there may be operator and equipment dependent error. And when we looked at a whole range of echo parameters that tell us about shunt volume, 
the two measurements with the highest degree of inter-rater reliability issues were PDA diameter and the LA to AO ratio, which unfortunately reflects the standard of care in most programs because most people are reliant on pediatric cardiology to provide these evaluations. So it's not surprising when you look, and this is some work that Fernando, Fernando Martins did with us when he did his PhD in Toronto kind of about five years ago, when you look at the relationship of diameter, whether it's indexed or not, to all of these markers that tell you is there fundamental dysregulation in either pulmonary blood flow or systemic blood flow, you can see that the R squared values are low. And that doesn't mean that diameter is not important, but what it's telling us is that flow is not just dependent on diameter, it's dependent on many other things which we will come back to. The other reason where a singular focus potentially is problematic is that we are looking at a three-dimensional structure and making a two-dimensional interpretation. And if you look at these images here, these PDAs come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Straight through is the classic cylindric shape PDAs, but we have funnel shape PDAs, serpentine shape PDAs. And why this is relevant is our assumption is when we take a single plane assessment of the vessel, we're assuming in cross-section that it is circular. The images on the right-hand side are pathological reconstructions of vessels um, from post-mortem. And what you can see is that the shape of the ductus in cross-section is highly variable. And why that's relevant is if you take the second picture at the top here, you may have overestimation or significant underestimation of the size of this vessel based on wherever your imaging plane is. So we need to move beyond single point estimates. The second major reason for concern with looking at contemporary data is unfortunately, we really have not done the desired trial, which is to identify patients who have the most problematic shunts and randomize them to intervention and not provide intervention for a substantial period of time in the control group. Even the PDA tolerate trial, it was up to 63% of patients receive medical therapy. So in essence, what we've done in the trials is we've compared treatment to treatment at another point in time. And the final thing, I think that two final points that I think are incredibly important with respect to interrogation of the literature is, is the data contemporary? And if you actually look at the studies that constituted Bill's meta-analysis, the median year of publication was 1994 which is prior to me even starting off in neonatology. And this is highly relevant because if you think of in 1994, we did not have 22 and 23 weekers surviving. We did not have nitric oxide. We had different ventilators, equipment and so forth. So one can argue that for the baby in 2021, these data probably don't help us and these trials probably should be expired. The other fundamental concern and something that has not really been articulated well is that when you look particularly at medical trials, one of the unfortunate consequences of medical therapy is that medical therapy doesn't always work and we don't necessarily adjust for that. The final point I want to make with respect to the, for the, to the literature is the issue of equipoise. We assume in trials that the patients randomized are comparable to the patients that were currently looking after. This is a post hoc study of the PDA tolerate trial that Melissa and Ron published. Up to 35% of the patients who were eligible were not enrolled. And the reason they were not enrolled was because of physician equipoise. Those babies were younger, those babies were smaller, sicker, less likely to have antenatal steroids. But interestingly, those babies were treated and treated early and their rates of the composite outcome of death or BPD or were significantly enhanced, suggesting that perhaps we really are not or have not studied the patients of interest. So why do we need to think about the law and why is it important in defining population of interest? Well, if you look at patients that have a large amount of blood flowing across the ductus, the two consequences are excessive pulmonary blood flow 
and systemic hypoperfusion. Excessive pulmonary blood flow, uh, just like our babies with congenital heart disease, single ventricle physiology, will lead to uh, alterations in lung compliance, prolonged ventilation, and so forth. 